Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me tonight. It's lovely to see so many faces in the audience. Uh, before we begin, I would like to pay my respects to the original custodians of the land where the Bandura and Bendigo campuses are located, as well as to where the Eureka Centre is located, to the Wurundjeri and the Jajarung, as well as the uh, traditional owners where others are located, and to acknowledge that their elders past, present and emerging, and that sovereignty has never been ceded. I would also like to welcome members from the Ballarat Hebrew congregation who are here tonight and uh, any descendants that we have of some of the women and the family that I'll be talking to about tonight. So great to have you all here. Thank you. Uh, I'd also like to state that I do not come from a Jewish background. I do not practice Judaism religiously, nor do I identify with it as an ethnicity. Uh, I apologize in advance for any mispronunciation of Hebrew which I have tried my best to master, but very sadly, I do not possess the ear, much less the tongue for languages. <laughs> um. Born on the sprawling streets of London in 1843, Rebecca Crocker's childhood was uprooted by her father's decision to migrate following a personal fam uh, tragedy for the family. After the death of Rebecca's mother, Esther, the Crocor family sailed to Australia, arriving in the Victorian colony in 1851. Rebecca migrated with her father, Isaac, as well as several brothers and a sister, undertaking the long four-month ship journey over rough seas and through humid weather to reach distant colonial soil. Later in the decade, the Crocor family were on the move again, this time journeying to Ballarat, where Isaac established himself as a tobacconist on the main road. On main road, sorry. It was not long before his sons followed his example, moving to the nearby areas to establish their own businesses. Within 15 years, the Crocker family had created an extensive mercantile and familial network through which money, goods and aid passed along. During this time, Rebecca remained with her father possibly helping him to run his store in Ballarat. Uh, located further down Main Road, with his own jewellery and watchmaker business, was London-born Sydney Abraham. In 1860, 26-year-old Sydney Abraham and Rebecca Kurokor, who was just 17 years of age at the time, married in the Ballarat Synagogue. A young bride, Rebecca soon became a young mother, raising a large family in Ballarat. Rebecca's story echoes that of countless other Jewish women, some of whom you will meet tonight as we explore the lives of Jewish women on the central Victorian goldfields, migrating mainly from Britain and Eastern Europe, from places such as Germany and Prussia. Jewish women of various ages and at different life stages settled in Bendigo and Ballarat. For Rebecca Abraham, as it was for many other women, the central Victorian goldfields were places of marriage, birth, and family, where faith thrived alongside colonial progress and golden promises. Yet Jewish brides on the goldfields tended to be younger than you know, average brides at the time and demonstrated an earlier shift towards middle-class trends. Jewish women who married on the central Victorian goldfields tended to be born in the colonies or in Britain. Uh, most Jews who arrived, however, tended to marry elsewhere particularly for those born in England. This pattern suggests that Jews were establishing intimate familial ties elsewhere before transporting them to the colonies, that they had been established and sort of moved to the goldfields. Uh, compared to wider colonial and Jewish trends, Jewish brides on the goldfields married at a younger age and with a greater difference in age between their spouses. So men tended to be around eight years older than their wives when they married at the time. This younger age at marriage for Goldfield's Jewish women may be related to their economic status. Incredibly few Jewish women were recorded in paid employment on their marriage certificates before, their, um, before they were married. Though this may be a fault of the marriage records. Uh, marriage may have been a means uh, to offer families the ability to shift the financial burden of older daughters. The predominance of young women who did not engage in paid labour displays the middle-class middle aspect of this community, 
who could potentially afford to keep dependent daughters, or at least their attempt to appear as such. Jewish women on the goldfields also tended to have smaller families compared to non-Jewish contemporaries, suggesting an earlier shift towards middle-class trends. While wider colonial trends indicate a family size of around 5.5 children for this period, uh, it was more common for couples on the goldfields to have larger families, averaging eight to nine children. Uh, the goldfields average for children was in decline over the second half of the 19th century. In Bendigo, fertility had declined to 4.6 births in 1901, while in Ballarat, women averaged 2.5 births by the turn of the century. Amongst Jewish women, the average number of children birthed was 5.6 children, with 3.9 children born on the central Victorian goldfields. There are some quite large families that are born on the goldfields, uh, but we see towards the end of the century that it sort of peters down to one or two children. This family size coincides with trends displayed in urbanized places in Europe and America, where the fertility of Jewish women was much smaller and in decline earlier than their non-Jewish counterparts. But for Jewish women, uh, the ideals surrounding their roles as wives, mothers, and in paid employment were shifting, at times liberating or constraining the opportunities available to them. Such shifts were, however, ingrained in the wider social, religious, and cultural changes that were occurring at the time. From the 18th century, Western ideologies concerning gender and religiosity were transformed, reshaping understandings of faith, families, and womanhood. While influenced by wider industrial and economic changes, this reconstruction was also grounded in an emerging middle class in Britain, British society, which grew in cohesion and authority across the 19th century. In Victorian Britain, middle class femininity increasingly concentrated on marriage, motherhood and the household, placing certain gendered and domestic expectations on women middle-class domesticity recast familiar dynamics, affording a higher status to the sentimental mother and the dutiful wife. Through these concepts, female domesticity and the family emerged as vehicles for engendering social harmony and as a means to counteract the discordant forces of the Industrial Revolution. Christian groups in particular responded to socioeconomic growth with religiously linked gender frameworks that drew upon middle-class domesticity, which first became the ideal and later the norm as the desired lifestyle. Colonial women interacted in complex and multifaceted ways with these Victorian middle-class ideologies that varied for families and religious communities. For Goldfield's Jewish women, these Victorian British ideals of femininity crossed with traditional Judaism, which likewise accorded certain gendered and familial responsibilities to women. Women occupied a different faith role to men in Judaism, uh, which was shaped by their expected labor both in the home and the wider community. Religiosity and public worship in Orthodox Judaism was the main purview of men. Women were encouraged to attend synagogue and engage in prayers. However, their observance was not accorded the same communal nor ritual importance as men's worship. Under Judaism, women and girls did not participate in public services, nor were they allowed to enter the rabbinate, positions of Jewish religious authority. As a result, the place of women in communal worship in Judaism, either as participants, contributors, or leaders, has tended to be assessed by scholars as being non-existent. There, are, there were, of course, Jewish women throughout history who have become notable persons, often the daughters of Jewish rabbis, who are recognized as holding exceptional amounts of knowledge regarding Jewish religious texts, such as the Telamon. Jewish women were also exempt from most time-bound commandments and were only expected to learn and practice the religious laws which were of most relevance to them. While men were required to follow all 613 commandments, uh, only three specifically referred to women. 
lighting candles on the Sabbath, halat, which refers to the burning of a small piece of dough prepared for breaking, uh, baking bread, and nida, the observance of certain laws surrounding ritual bath immersion and marital purity. These religious laws and commandments continued as a significant element, element <coughs> excuse me, of women's lives, even while conceptions of Jewish women were adapted from the mid 19th century. Nathan Spielvogel, in the Annals of the Ballarat Hebrew Congregation, incorporated the oral history given by Julia Bernstein in 1923. Uh, Julia Solomon, who later married Jacob Bernstein and then became Julia Bernstein, uh, in, who married Jacob Bernstein in the, in the Ballarat Synagogue in 1863, recalled that Jewish women did use the mikvah, the ritual bath, at the appointed times in order to absorb nidah. The mikvah, which was rented from William Grilby, whose public baths were located in Grenville Street. In 1886, Nuren Spilvogel donated a mikvah to the congregation, which was located in the Corporation Baths in Armstrong Street. That Jewish women continued to follow these religious obligations indicates the continued importance placed by them on Jewish identity <coughs> excuse me, and practices, even when such laws might have been difficult to observe. Despite their limited institutional religious role, the activity of Jewish women in familial and domestic life was and continues to be essential to Jewish practices, actions which could extend beyond the home space. In many traditional Jewish communities in uh, Europe, Jewish wives could be expected to supplement their family's income. This economic role was at times tied to the religious obligations of men in Judaism, in which it was considered meritorious to spend long hours studying religious texts, a task restricted to males. In order for husbands to devote their time to studying, wives often had to assume financial responsibilities. This expectation anticipated women's engagement outside the home or even beyond the Jewish community, which was at odds with mainstream Jewish middle-class domesticity. The financial obligation of wives usually enabled them to hold a substantial amount of authority within the family as a result of their economic role and their management of the household. The position of economic helpmate continued in the colonies and was often a necessity at times even an expected labour to be formed by Jewish women, as will be discussed more later. Although it could be difficult to reconcile, both Judaism and middle-class ideals became important to many Jewish women and their families in the cold fields, as it was for Rebecca and Sidney Abraham. After their marriage, Sidney and Rebecca may have continued to live at St Sydney's store and Ballarat's main road. Oral family tradition also places them at about this time as living in a tent. The Abraham's household consisted of a number of persons beyond the nuclear family, which was common for Jewish homes and goldfields, as elsewhere. At times, relatives and kin from Rebecca's side of the family, the Krakos, resided in the Abraham household and work, worked alongside Sydney and in his business. Christian domestic servants were also employed and worked within the intimate setting of the Abraham's family home. Such home compositions were important mediators of class, faith and community, are providing vital networks that could maintain and uplift families in times of need. For the Abraham family, their middle class status became harder to maintain as they experienced financial difficulties. In 1865, the family relocated to Bridge Street. In the same year, Sydney's pledged goods were purchased by Joseph Crocker, his brother-in-law, though this merely delayed the inevitable. One year later, Sydney filed for insolvency. During this hardship, the family were able to, start to find support from Rebecca's brothers, who provided Sydney with a job and a cottage for his family to reside in. Rebecca and her wider familial links continued to look after the family and work to maintain a respectable family image, as well as strong familial attachments to Judaism. For the Abraham family, Judaism was a significant aspect of their colonial identities. Sidney Abraham was a member of the Ballarat Hebrew Congregation Committee, sitting as treasurer in 1862, and some of their eldest sons had their bar mitzvah, a coming of age ceremony for Jewish boys, in the Ballarat synagogue. 
the Abraham children also attended the local Hebrew school, taking part in picnics and social events, as well as competing in the local examinations each year. Their involvement in the local Hebrew congregation and school displays a desire to incorporate and connect with institutional Jewish life, that very likely shaped their ideas of familial duty and home. The dual discourses available to Jewish women concerning the home, the family, and their role, their role as mothers found convergence in colonial Australia. It was, however, an aspect of their identifications that required mediation as discourses around the Jewish mother shifted. In colonial Victoria, British femininity prescribed Jewish mothers a new domestic faith role that affected how they mediated middle-class ideals. In 1872, the Melbourne-based newspaper, Australian Israelite, published an article on the Jewish woman that detailed the affection and sacrifices expected of the Jewish mother. As the article outlined, the Jewish mother, quote, will not think she has fulfilled a mother's duty when she merely gives her children her love and her solicitude, which are the natural instincts of her heart. She will look upon her children, not only as her dearest treasures here, the joys of her youth, and the consolations of her old age, but as beings who greatly depend upon her for their happiness here and hereafter, being she must prepare for this life and for eternity. While demonstrating the perceived emotional and mental consciousness childbearing endowed, the article also highlighted a new emerging social and religious expectation of Jewish mothers. Across the 19th century, an increasing emphasis was placed on the strong emotional ties that united a successful family, which re-evaluated and prescribed women new maternal practices, such as child socialization, and at times also um, religious teaching. This change in understandings of familial relationships worked to reshape the ideas surrounding Jewish mothers. The Jewish mother was not only concerned with securing her child's happiness in this life, but also for what would follow afterwards, Prefer referring to the mother's role in providing religious education to her children. Realities, however, proved more complicated. Um. While Jewish women gained a basic understanding of Judaism's theology, commandments and values, they often were uneducated in Hebrew and Jewish religious texts. Jewish education expanded during the 19th century to include girls although the religious knowledge continued to be undervalued compared to men's. This idea of the religious teacher was also negotiated against the realities of Jewish households and colonial society, where women juggled various responsibilities and assumed multiple expectations regarding the home, their children and their family. One of the, great, one of the most common roles uh, to occupy Jewish women in the home space was as a mother a greater understanding of which can be gained by examining in greater detail one of the few remnants to survive of the home labour enacted by Jewish women, the making of baby dresses. Influenced by shifting ideas of dress, childhood and female domestic labour, Jewish mothers sewed clothing for their children that reflected the social, religious and cultural identifications of families. Held in the impressive collection of the Jewish Museum of Australia, are three white baby dresses made by Rebecca Abraham for her children between 1860 and 1880. While the Abraham baby dresses do not have a specific stated use, nor was any provided by the accompanying fam uh, oral family history, I believe that they may have been used for a Brit Malal, a ceremony of circumcision in Judaism that holds an, an important and enduring place within Jewish uh, religion and tradition. The three dresses are in remarkably good condition. An amazing feat for a family with 14 children on the dusty Ballarat goldfields. The quality of the surviving Abraham's dresses suggests that these clothes held a public function and were worn infrequently as they were put aside either for special visitors, religious ceremonies or other formal occasions. While Australian collections remain sparse, a significant record of similar baby dresses has survived in America. A, a majority of these American baby dresses do have a stated use as being a Brit Malal dress, particularly those which are in good condition, most likely because they were only worn once. 
These American baby dresses, many of which extend back into the 19th century, are of a similar style to those produced by Rebecca Abraham. The stylistic features of these American Jewish dresses were also common for less formal baby dresses in Western places at this time. However, this also stands as evidence that it was being adopted for certain religious ceremonies. The baby dresses sewed by Rebecca Abraham drew upon the surrounding fashion and cultural milieu, conforming to the standard style of infant dress, which was popular across the British Empire, with lace or embroidery, white in colour, and with a long sweeping body. The baby dresses were made of white cotton and include both hand and machine stitching. Lorinda Kramer, an expert on Goldfields clothing and sewing, noted how the buttonholes on these dresses were hand stitched, while other parts of the garment had been made using a sewing machine. In the 1860s and 1870s, sewing machines did not include a buttonhole feature, which explains why the dresses include both hand and machine, machine sewing. The Abraham family did own sewing machines, which were sold before their later removal to Melbourne. The baby dresses also include lace, which Kramer suggests was bought and not made by Rebecca, which June Stringer, a lace expert, also noted. As Rebecca Abraham adopted the style of infant dress of her middle-class British peers, she also acquired the social and cultural systems that they were situated in becoming a means through which others could gauge her family's social and class status. The Abraham baby dresses were laid with social and cultural significance that spoke of expected female domesticity, social class and identity. While a necessity for working class mothers, the making and mending of infant clothing was also a conventional genteel task engaged in by women, either for their own children or for that of close family. Gentle women sewed infant and children's clothing as it was considered to be part of the expected mater maternal care to be enacted by mothers, though it was often constrained by material access, needlework skills and familiarity with style. This expected care of providing infant clothing was made more arduous with every birth, as clothes had to be made or old ones mended for proper use a task which was made more onerous on the early gold fields by the scarcity of fabrics. When children's clothing was worn correctly, it acted as a performed symbol of respectable middle-class families, indicating that they had acquired discipline and control, which were considered central behavioural values at the time. As Lorinda Kramer noted, an obedient child wearing white revealed a mother's training, while on a, and in a disobedient child uh, it would quickly be dirtied. Maintaining a high standard of cleanliness, which the baby dresses demonstrate, was a means through which Rebecca performed and embodied her class and domestic values, through which she indicated to her peers that the expected care and female labour had been enacted. The making and wearing of the baby dresses not only displayed to others the family's social position, but also strengthened and maintained it working to further reinforce and mediate the acculturation process underway for the Abraham. To assist in this arduous task of cleaning and mending and binding clothing, servants were often hired, though their presence could complicate the domestic religious negotiations of Jewish women, complicating their roles as wives and mothers. Mm -hmm. Jewish women on the central Victorian goldfields hired Christian servants to serve within the intimate spaces of the home. Until the 1880s, most servants in Victoria tended to be immigrant Irish girls, a source of colonial domestic labour that diminished once assisted migration began to cease. Servants in Jewish households on the central Victorian goldfields most often came under the domain of women who advertised, interviewed, employed and paid the persons hired. Servants such as Maria Patterson, who at the time of her employment in Rebecca Abraham's household, um, was 15 to 17 years of age. For Jewish families who either were or aspired to middle-class status, employing domestic servants was one way to come closer to this aspiration. Rebecca reinforces her notions of middle-class conformity by specifying the requirement that only respectable girls need apply for positions in her household in her newspaper advertisements. 
Uh, it also is revealed that Maria was uh, stealing items from the Abraham family, which is also another reason why respectable was probably in there. <laughs> While middle-class families from the mid to late 19th century complained of a lack of suitable servants, securing the engagement of domestics could be harder for Jewish women as a result of their religion. For example, the industrial schools in Ballarat and Bendigo, institutions that raised neglected children for useful employment, refused to allow Jewish families to foster Christian girls from these schools to act as domestics. Children were only to be fostered to families who were of the same faith. As a result, Jewish women relied more fully on other means to find servants, mainly newspapers. In Bendigo, Elizabeth Herman, the converted wife of Solomon Herman, frequently advertised for a general servant. From 1881 to 1890, the Herman family employed and lost a number of servants. This quick turnover of domestics may have been due to the large size of the family, which required more work from a servant. Uh, the severe financial trouble also experienced by the Herman family may have also led to inconsistencies in wages. Even within struggling Jewish households, servants were considered a necessity and were in high demand, finding employment even in the homes of the Jewish minister. While domestics could ease workloads, the potential ignorance of Christian servants regarding Judaism provided additional challenges. The presence of Christian servants in Jewish households complicated the continued observance of Judaism. Kosher food practices, the lighting of Sabbath candles, and the laws regarding the cleaning and the clearing of the house on specific holidays were likely to have been unknown to Christian servants. Instead, the role of the servant may have been altered to minimise their impact on home practices. In 1894, Mrs Goldstein, the wife of the Bendigo Jewish minister at the time, advertised for the services of a general servant and specified that no cooking was to be required. The Goldstein family were likely keeping kosher in their home, and so the task of cooking may have fallen completely to Mrs Goldstein to ensure proper practices were observed. Christian servants not only influenced arrangements of the practice uh, of Judaism in the home, but also brought Christian faith understandings into the Jewish home space. Jewish children could experience close and intimate contact with Christian practices and beliefs through domestics and nursemaids, who were often left unattended to supervise their wards. In Ballarat, the Conan family owned and operated a hotel the Royal Mail, where the family also resided. When Simon Coman was not at the premises, the management of the hotel was left with his wife, Rachel, who not only managed the hotel, but also their children and the household. <laughs> to assist Rachel with these multiple and demanding tasks, a nursemaid was usually employed to supervise the children. When a fire occurred in the servant's bedroom in 1878, the family had in their employ Catherine Cahir and, as a nursemaid as well as two other female Christian servants who worked in the hotel. Catherine, the 16-year-old daughter of Irish Catholic immigrants, likely undertook the position of nursemaid after her father deserted the family in 1876. Kihia had prolonged and personal contact with Conan's two small children, engaging in repeated daily conversations in which information, stories and emotions were likely shared. This contact between nursemaids and their wards could have a significant impact on children. As other studies of Christian domestics and Jewish children attest, servants and nursemaids often familiarise their wards with Christianity, teaching children Christian bedtime prayers and songs. The relationship of nursemaids and children included small everyday moments of intimacy and shared activity. The informal cultural and religious dialogues that occurred uh, through the employment of Christian servants, may have been a concern for Jewish mothers who had to weigh the benefits of domestic help against perceived negatives. The presence of Christ Christian domestic servants and British class ideals added additional layers to the social identity of Jewish households. The employment of management and management of domestic servants was understood to be a means of indicating a family's middle class status as part of the choreographed performance of middle-class domesticity, 
which Jewish women on the goldfields actively ascribe to. Christian domestic servants serving in Jewish households shaped understandings and practices enacted in homes, and in the process revised the family's home life and experiences. These roles also included religious negotiations. The different practices, demands, and multi-faith compositions of Jewish households could affect the religious home life and identities of Jewish women, influencing their ability to transfer faith, culture, and social mores to their children. Alongside the demands of caring for children and overseeing servants, Jewish women also had to mediate expectations regarding paid and unpaid labour. On the central Victorian goldfields, Jewish women were increasingly engaging in paid labour and work as rising Brit British middle class ideas of femininity provided new occupational opportunities. Yet in other ways, it, almost, it also limited access to paid work and rose expectations of unpaid labour, shaping their public and home lives. Through domestic femininity, women's labour could be linked to socially class boundaries. Divisions between unpaid and paid labour were viewed as an important marker of social class. Working class women were often required to engage in employment, whereas middle class women were expected to remain dependent on families. The realities of colonial life and the available evidence present a different and much more complicated narrative. For Jewish women on the goldfields, work drew upon middle class ideals. However, it was also defined by colonial conditions and the softened boundary between the intimate home space and the worldly spirit of business. In colonial Victoria, women were increasingly joining the paid labour force in a variety of roles. In 1871, 20% of women over 20 and 10% of women under 20 were engaged in some form of paid labour. By 1881, this number had risen to 38% for those over 20 and 14% for those aged under 20, though these numbers declined by 1891. This decrease has been connected by scholars to the urbanisation of Melbourne, which historian Graham Davison argued resulted in a strengthening of ideas on female domesticity. The lower percentage, however, was probably also the result of the removal of women in farm work from the census count for ideological reasons. Women in Victoria were most likely to be employed in the domestic or textile sector, working either within home spaces as servants and nursemaids or in factories of various sizes. Factories proved a popular alternative to, to domestic service, particularly for colonial born girls as it required fewer working hours, higher wages, and provided more freedom as they were no longer under the strict gaze of a mistress. Women could also transfer factory or manufacturing work into households as peace workers, sewing garments together in the more intimate space of the home, an area of work that was rapidly rising from the late 1870s. Manufacturing industries were more numerous in Ballarat compared to Bendigo, which may have facilitated easier access to paid labour and the slower decline of the Jewish population in this town. Jewish women tended to reflect these statistics, moving into textile or piecework industries. However, the majority identified in this study tended to record no official occupation. While certain kinds of paid work were available to Jewish women, their employment was also defined by prevailing social ideologies. Jewish women, mainly those who were unmarried and saw economic independence, drew upon British middle-class ideas of respectability to define their engagement in paid labour. Middle-class women who did wish to engage in paid work often faced certain barriers. As scholar Bronwyn Rivers noted of British women in the mid-19th century, middle-class women who wished to enter in the paid labour force often confronted the double burden of being untrained and potentially being defined as unnatural. Work as either a domestic companion, a governess, or as a teacher were generally the only occupations open to women who wished to retain their respectability. On the centre Victorian goldfields, young, educated Jewish women increasingly entered into these areas of employment. Rosa Vince, a, Jewish, a single Jewish woman living in Ballarat with her family, obtained her a permission to teach in 1876 and was engaged as a teacher at the local St Paul's State School. 
Vince was the first Jewess in Victoria to pass the examination for teaching under the Board of Education. Additionally, Rosa acted as an assistant teacher at the local Hebrew school, uh, alongside the Jewish minister who often taught these classes, uh, helping to engender faith learning to Ballarat's Jewish children. In 1883, Rosa married Joseph Davis, a clothier located in Melbourne, and relocated to reside with her husband in the same year. Educated Jewish women also applied their talents to act as governesses, women such as Louisa Fredman, who prepared a son of the Silberg family for, their, for his bar mitzvah. This religious educational role was a significant shift from traditional Judaism, where study and learning were the main domain of men. The changing ideas surrounding Jewish women, coupled with the middle-class notions of labour, had not only enabled women to become religious teachers of children, but may have also made this type of employment desirable. Alternatively, Jewish women could also be constrained by this same ideology. British colonial society and communal Jewish institutions limited women's involvement in this area of work by ensuring that only certain types of Hebrew education were accessible for Jewish women and girls. While the work undertaken by Jewish women was in part defined by notions of Victorian middle-class ideals, colonial assumptions and conditions increasingly presumed unpaid female labour, impacting how women participated in the colonial workforce. In the colonies, there was a growing expectation for women to perform labour, mainly in an unpaid capacity, where they acted as a type of helpmate to support the paid work of male relatives. This assumption was a result of a range of factors. The combination of labour shortages and the isolated nature of many settlements required many women and men to adapt British ideals as they were obliged to engage in more unconventional work compared to those in England. As these British ideals were altered, the work of women quickly became part of the colonial ideal for wives that remained even after more remote areas had urbanised. Historian Patricia Grimshaw outlined the expectation placed on women in the late 19th century, in which the good colonial life would, quote, not only be no expense, she would often earn nearly as much as her husband. This idea of the economic contributor was further augmented for Jewish women by the convergence between home spaces and business pursuits. Similar to many non-Jewish groups, mercantile Jewish families on the goldfields frequently lived either above or adjacent to their businesses that enabled for wives to easily move between the home space and the public workspace. And there's statistics which suggest that um, on the gold fields, um, quite a number of Jewish men are engaging in mercantile trades as shopkeepers, business owners. So there's quite a large proportion of Jewish women on the gold fields who have that experience of the home space and the workspace being adjoining or adjacent. On the centre of Victorian gold fields, Jewish women, like their non-Jewish counterparts, engaged in a range of unpaid work in familial businesses. The labour completed by Jewish women could be subsumed under the businesses owned by their husbands, as the managerial acunum of women often extended to family enterprises. Louis Hollander, his wife Hannah and their five small children arrived in Ballarat in the late 1860s and were later joined by Louis's brother, Jacob Hollander, and his family. Louis worked as a tailor and later as a clothes manufacturer. By the mid-1880s, Lewis Hollander and his family had relocated to Carlton near Melbourne. A royal commission into clothing manufacturing in the colony was undertaken in the early 1890s, in which Hollander presented evidence of his own practices. Jacob Hollander stated that he had been in business for 14 years, but only employed the members of his own family indoors. He was a shirt manufacturer, but for four months had not employed any outdoor hands. As Hollander noted, his family were making shirts in the home, a business to which all family members contributed and was likely a long-standing practice in his home. The unpaid labour of wives and children was not only expected, but could be an economic necessity when businesses were doing poorly, as Hollander's was. While British ideas sought to confine women to the home, colonial realities assumed a degree of labour from women, complicating their position within the home and adding to their responsibilities regarding their family. As such, women's labour created tensions between ideas of paid and unpaid work, as well as between the private home and outside employment. 
Though Jewish women often appeared as part of larger familial and male-owned businesses, this should not downplay their considerable economic roles. Jewish women could hold significant economic responsibilities and were able to act independently of their husbands. However, the type of paid work women engaged in could potentially engender their middle-class status. Isaac and Esther Jonas arrived in the Victorian colony in the mid to late 1850s. However, they did not settle in Ballarat until the early 1870s. Upon relocating to Ballarat, the couple purchased the Earl of Zetland Hotel. The hotel generated a substantial amount of wealth for the couple, enabling them to buy other hotels and to donate expensive ritual items to the Ballarat Hebrew congregation, which were often purchased overseas in Europe when they had gone traveling. When Isaac undertook travel away from the colony, his hotels were transferred to Esther, who would operate and manage the hotels in his absence. It seems Esther, uh, Esther Jonas also owned hotels independently from her husband and was a successful businesswoman in her own right. Jewish women on the goldfields could also challenge expected gender roles, engaging in the public realm of work and by assuming pronounced financial responsibility at times shouldering the management of businesses in the place of husbands. For female hotel owners, such as Esther, who comprised 30% of Melbourne and suburban hotel licenses in 1889, uh, their respectable class status as they engaged in this trade could be dubious. Hotel keeping did encompass ascribed female attributes, such as domesticity, maternal restraint and respectability, although there were aspects mediated through peer esteem and social reputations. Esther likely maintained her respectability and good character through, uh, through her marriage status uh, and her family's engagement with the local synagogue and its various communities, building her communal standing through charity. Often um, community get-togethers or social events or organisations that were organised through the Ballarat Hebrew congregation were hold, held at uh, Esther's hotel. As Jewish women gained appreciable economic positions, they could be required to negotiate their social status and communal identity, and how they would perform middle-class respectability. This mediation involved degrees of active choice and obligation, as Jewish women responded to familial economic demands and colonial ideals. British middle-class feminine ideals defined and altered how Jewish women engaged in paid employment and in familial businesses reshaping their understandings and the expectations placed upon them. Jewish mothers and wives undertook various, often interrelated positions that were not neatly divided into either public or domestic fears, but rather nonetheless impacted the lives of Jewish women in the home space, their communal relationships and their familial experiences. On the central Victorian goldfields, British ideologies and the pressures to perform middle-class fem femininity both actual and imagined, significantly shaped the role and responsibilities of Jewish women in the home and in more public spaces. British feminine domesticity redefined the boundaries of a British and Jewish identity that held social, familial and communal implications. The impact of these practices extend beyond women to affect children and men as well, who likewise experienced changes in the home space as a result. It was not just men who dominated in the more public arena of the synagogue, and public work who balanced Jewish religion with British social and cultural identifications. But Jew Jewish women were also working to create and maintain these dual identities. Jewish women and the decisions they made regarding their practices, observances and labour played an important role in creating and reinforcing not only their own identity, but also their families as well, contributing in subtle but significant ways to the acculturation of the community. I hope you enjoyed the presentation and thank you for listening. <laughs>